One of the attackers is in front of this reporter right now. He appears to be heavily armed and very dangerous. Imagine making a game that co-ops revolutionary imagery and sidles up to a critique of oppressive corporations. Then you follow it up with an incredibly unserious, wacky woohoo idiot action flick. And then you do it twice. Welcome to Red Faction! If you remember Red Faction, you probably know it as that 2001 Half-Life-esque FPS. Hey, how's that mortgage going? Developer Volition made a real attempt to put fingers in pies. There's a PS2 version, there's a mobile version, there's a terrible N-Gage version. This... I don't recall Red Faction being this important. Made by John Romero? Like, Doom John Romero? Holy shit. That's a series tradition, by the way. They really got around. Title by title, someone you know played Red Faction. It's not just an FPS series. Like, literally, by the third game, it's a third-person shooter. It's also one of the pioneers of destructible environments in games, a concept that's core to every entry. Maybe that's why they were pushed so hard. Could have been a pillar of video game history, but nowadays, the series is very very dead, so grab your remote charges and let's get excavating. This is it. The day K-Bash finally reviews a boomer shooter. Now all y'all boomy shooter reviewers play Vagrant Story or Knights in the Nightmare. Do it, Ooh. You won't. Red Faction the First is a pretty difficult game to get running nowadays, at least on PC. And you need third-party software to make it function at all. I still ended up with screen tearing and didn't notice till after the fact, so don't let anyone tell you I deserve rights. If you pick this up by chance, you'll notice how hard the intro bangs. It really comes out swinging. We get a cutscene that details humankind's expansion to Mars, the corporation heading the operation, and the draconian working conditions and workers' rights abuses. Oh, and a deadly pandemic is sweeping the minds too. I'll give him some props. I think Bezos would pull this stuff in a second given the opportunity. Yeah, it might look heavy-handed to someone less cued into workers' struggles, but I'm telling you, Amazon's one hop off from beating its workers for fun, and that's with legislation and regulation. Take that whole op off planet, watch how fast it crumbles. Anyway, you start out walking through the mines. And me? Yeah, well, threaten this! He just, he just killed that guy! He's shooting at me! What the? What the frick? You don't get a choice in the intro. You're made complicit and wanted dead instantly. I like a well-lubricated plot. Sometimes friction causes chafing, you know, rubs raw. I'm glad the studio handled it right. It might not look like much, just a typical FPS at first glance, but this early title was genuinely innovative for one thing. Geomod, or Geometry Modification Technology, the engine Volition built to facilitate destructible environments. Suddenly gameplay takes on this expansive, childlike scavenger hunt whimsy. You can blow up the walls. You can circumvent doors! You can do anything! Not really, though, of course. All games need rules and limitations. There is no play, at least for most players, without direction, order, incentives, and rewards. It would have been fun, back in the day, blowing up walls, but there's no real need for it. And most of the game's objectives are explicit point A to point B running guns. But that's okay. It's still functional. You don't need environmental exploration to have fun. Die, oh, oh shit! Gunplay is fun and frenetic. The game was lauded as one of the PS2's best shooters, period. Which is kind of fascinating in retrospect. It doesn't really feel like much, but it's a quick, fun romp. You've got varied, interesting weapons. You can ride a lift. It's one of them pre-Halo armor pickups instead of shields shooters, and that leads to the sort of conservative, strategic play that feels terrifying when you're on the defensive, and brutally empowering when you know you can drag everyone in the room screaming down to hell. You'll still make use of explosions at times. Late in the game, there's a grate you can't pop, but you can take out the wall around it with explosives. It takes a lot of trust in your players and system to pull something like this. People don't like being told they're stupid, but they are. We all are. And there will be players who miss it. People who put the game down because Geomod isn't consistently relevant throughout the game. While I wish Geomod factored more heavily into the playtime, leaving it secondary to the play let the team craft a sharp FPS, at least. 
or that's what I would say if there weren't a couple of stealth segments too. Damn, hitting all kinds of platforms, expanding the FPS gameplay repertoire, Geo mod. I get the sense that either someone really believed in this thing, or the team was trying to make a super game here, expand the scope past its pillars. Unfortunately, the stealth bits are miserable for the most part. They're not unplayable, just extremely weird to experience after a couple rounds of fast-paced slaughter, hard swapping to unclear detection Ooh. rules and boundaries, not having meaningful stealth takedown options and other luxuries we take for granted in those sorts of games. How about them vehicle segments? As I think the bucket's full, sometimes you're roped into some light vehicle gameplay, which they were apparently proud of as something that made Red Faction distinct from Half-Life. Fair enough, right? At least they're short-lived and tolerable, and I like that at least two of them are mostly calm and quiet. Still, Red Faction has multiple features, each of which has been or could be handled better in other games. You also do a fair bit of land exploration with minimal or no combat. They come after heavy gunplay bits, and I like the intention in that, letting the player breathe. You can flesh out a world that way, show a dingy mine and a superficially chromed over office space, and let the player act as a voyeur peering into the universe a bit. Please, zoomer hype down about graphics, I'm begging you. It's immersive! FPS games in particular, I swear, playing alone with my back turned to the door at night, I'll get sucked in and genuinely spooked in just an hour of play, imagining someone's behind me or thinking I heard something downstairs, probably as a result of getting shot at in all directions and bouts of overwhelming silence or like light psychosis. I can feel the pull to the genre, poking into that bubble-like liminal coating between reality and fiction. It's something you can't convey with footage, and it's where most of my appreciation comes from, so you'll just have to believe me on this one. Like, even if I'm giving the game heck for inflating itself past a clean and clear scope, being aspirational is cool and admirable. It's obvious that thought went into the world. I mean, you barely see the surface of Mars. Very little of the game is set topside, but like, who cares about a bunch of empty orange space? These very jogs through burgeoning human infrastructure are the real draw. Now, you're probably thinking that means I think the story is good. And like, kinda? It's not a literary masterwork, it's a clean-cut action film. Your hand is forced early on, you almost escape, never mind the escape ship exploded. Oh, no. I could have been the dead people. Oh my God. And so the plot rises and falls, twists and turns, you learn disturbing things about the corporation in charge of the operation, big surprise, and try to root out the corruption and protect the workers with the Red Faction revolutionaries. See, it's not bad, it works, and, like its revolutionary imagery suggests, does succeed at presenting a critique of unchecked capitalism in corporations. Then there's a scene where the villain, who looks like this, <laughs> sneers at the player over his friends being experimented on and says, In the advancement of science, anyone, even you, Parker, can serve a useful purpose. Hear that, stupid working class individual? Even you can be ground up into paste and canned for our profit margin. This is extremely fool subtle. I appreciate it though. You know, media illiterate types might not pick up on these very low key vibrations. So there's plenty to appreciate about Red Faction. It works hard to suck the player in and show something with its narrative that's still relevant 20 years later and possibly forever at the rate the world's going. Even drenched an action hero cringe and science fiction tropes, even hamming it up as hard as it does. Red Faction's good-ass games. So what happened with 2? I'm kind of grateful 2 exists how it does, because now I can let my true self fade and open the door to the demon known as... What the f*** was y'all thinking? This game... How? Why? What? Did a publisher do this to you? Did management find the revolutionary bit too real? Did you just want to have a little fun? Have a little shooty gamer fun? Like, setting the actual gameplay aside, which is fine, whatever. The entire framework, the legacy of Red Faction and what it represents explodes in this entry. It's amazing! First off, that Halo-esque intro, you are not slick. Walk that shit back and show some goddamn respect. Thing takes place on Earth, but I don't care about the setting shift at all. You can only shake things up so much with Mars. Okay, fine. But guys, this is the cringiest action flick dumbassery. Okay, roll the clip. Quill. Sharpshooter. Tangier. 
covert reconnaissance. Repta, heavy weapons, <laughs> the ultimate destructive force. The original was also tapping into that idea, but it was at least a few hops off from comic schlock. Look at this. <laughs> Why is it this? slow? Oh, no. The red faction of this title happens to be a band of mercenaries with no connection to the original, and setting that aside, we're treated to intros of the various action hero squad mates Molov, Tangier, Quill, Repta, Shrike, and winner of the most embarrassing protag name award, Alias. Alias because he has an alias. Fair enough, right? I've heard some distinguished individuals call subtext, quote, for cowards. So why not come in like an 80 pound morning star, kill bads, shoot guns, look at titties! Nanotechnology developed by the villain of the first game made its way back to Earth thanks to the EDF, the Earth Defense Force, who acted as lawbringers at the end of the original. It's not a total shakeup. People with a monopoly of power tend to abuse it, so it's not a particularly surprising twist, and the player is cast directly into the revolutionary force fighting against the EDF super soldiers. This is still a red faction game. It's still positioning revolution at the forefront. In particular, your squad out to kill the dictatorial chancellor of the Republic of the Commonwealth on Earth. This Stalin looking dude named Victor Sopot. Victor Sopot is one crazy mother. You gotta love the guy or you will die. Okay. Alright, let's get on that. Red Faction 2 trades most of the exploration and geomod potential of the first for raw action. It's possibly the greatest example of a single foci actually damaging the experience, because while gameplay is tight and shooting is fun, it's extremely tedious to run through. It only takes one evening to clear this game, but it'll easily take longer for anyone not plugged directly into the boomer shooter matrix. Things are slog to play. You kill incredible numbers of people in your bloody coup, and while the thing takes a few moments to breathe or dump exposition on the player via radio chatter, you're never truly safe from harm. Oh, that was a train. Now, we can afford to be nice sometimes. The level design is pretty interesting, at, at least early on, right? The tutorial stage teaching the player to destroy towers without making use of Geomod at all. Okay, let's just skip that one. The first stage with its cover-heavy flashpoint gameplay. The sewers emanating moody terror. The train crossing you're made to weave between while planting bombs. The military base and others. Each level feels distinct and fairly enjoyable to run through. Imagine surviving in the military for years and some guy pops around the corner like, can I get that bugle please? It's a hard game to meaningfully critique on its functional merits. That said, Geomod has almost nothing to do with the game. You can destroy things in a few places, but even compared to the original, it's sparse. In fact, most environments aren't destructible at all, which begs so many questions. I'm going to assume 2's Geomod functionalities were a victim of what I described earlier, that games need limitations, certainly to provide a cropped player experience, and that's exactly what they went for. Games like 3 to 4 hours, only it may have cost the experience some much needed umami flavor. And sure, you can traipse around in your little mech while you have it and ride your little tank while the game lets you and fly through the city in a helicopter, even see some quality sights in an attempt at world building. But there's no intimacy. It's a slideshow, not a museum. You're a passenger, not an excavator, because you're not given control over any of these except the submarine segment and the mech bit. And even then, you're made to stay trained on enemies through the entirety of these moments or risk a restart. I don't think I need to explain why being forced through the goddamn turret section twice isn't an option. I'm spoiling the mid-game twist and I don't care. You're getting spoiled. Check it. You catch up with Sopot. Respect Sopot! Fear Sopot! Sopot is your master! And after his insane ramble, you burn him up with the emissions of a launching missile. I'm really impressed by the game's commitment to being as wacky and stupid as possible. Honestly, it's a trip. The Red Faction, however, seizes control of the government and turns on the player. Seems he didn't have a weapon. It was symbolic. Our new government would have ushered in an era of peace. Peace? Then what use would we be? I don't want to give the game credit for good writing or anything, but... That might as well be identical to the Praetorian Guard and Emperor Claudius, okay? Consolidation of power, maintaining your role in society, 
is a driving factor for conflict. Okay, you're made to hunt down your old comrades, but this is actually really good. I hated all of these guys. Listen to Repta. Hero hid behind his desk. And now I get really video gamey boss fights out of him. I mean, mine is Shrike and one of the women. I, I can't be bothered to figure out which one she is. The original game made use of boss fights too, but for like a giant worm and the bullet sponge villain. They weren't great and they were few, but Red Faction 2 is a more mechanically confident game. It just has better fights. You're made to run through a zombie infested level in case you were worried the game got smart all of a sudden and made to deal with both swarming goons and sniper fire while DPS racing the boss. It's surprisingly challenging challenging, unless you break it like I did. My bad. <laughs> the Repta fight is mostly an excuse to fire off a powerful new rocket launcher, but you're also made to scurry through a multi-tiered arena while this hulking freak chases you. Not bad. And the final battle's a hardcore shootout with a mecked up Mola, but it's tense. A single thin wall divides you and him at any point. It's the smallest context shift, but enough to add a cat and mouse element to the battle. All of them are like that, actually. You're made to play defensive at times and push aggressively when you have a win. It's engaging. Good stuff. Really, my issues with Red Faction 2 have more to do with identity than anything. The play is mostly fine and pretty well cropped, but it also fails to communicate with effective level design more often than it should, especially for a linear run, and it wrenches control away from the player enough to blur the world building. The boss battles are cool and let you kill reprehensible annoying idiots for fun, but the soul of Red Faction was revolutionary. Not just literally about a revolution, but pushing boundaries, getting silly with it's standing out, trying new things. Red Faction 2 feels like a really crummy comic for 10 year olds populated with Saturday morning cartoon characters. It feels tired. It feels like it was made to satisfy someone or some requirements rather than made on its own merits. I guess that's business. Shrike used his skills as a pilot to become a civilian consultant. Good for him. You know what? We stand. Oh, I know why you're really here. You ain't need a lot of meat. K-Bash knows. K-Bash knows. I bought Red Faction Guerrilla in the discounted section of a New York GameStop, maybe sometime late 2009. Best 30 bucks I ever spent. You ever played this game? This is one of the only good open worlds from that era. It's not even close. And it's because it relies on its unique mechanics to sell the world instead of pushing the world in spite of the play. So Guerrilla begins with Johnny Baldo heading to Mars for work meeting up with his brother who somehow failed to communicate that, uh-oh, the EDF who've effectively taken over the colonization of Mars happened to be draconian f oh. psychopaths. Thanks, bro. You return from a light tutorial segment only for your brother to, like, not have a permit or something. He's shot dead in seconds and you're made to join up with the revolutionary Red Faction to survive. That escalated so fast my skin is gone. Can you believe that intro though? I mean, I can. I played the first Red Faction and it seems like a direct attempt to keep the oldest fans looped in despite the overt shift in design. We like a little revolution. We like a little dismantling of abusive systems. We like a little... It's a third-person shooter set in an open world with destructible buildings at the core of the gameplay. It's one of the best cheap plays you could ask for in all of gaming. Incredibly fun to engage with or just sit back on easy mode and chill. It's been remastered and it's on like four platforms. You have no excuse. Sorry. Remastered. It's remastered. I mean, it's riddled with questionable elements, and it's kind of ugly, but the core is good. I'll talk a bit about everything, but let's be clear. Gorilla is mostly gameplay, and that's why I like it, actually. It cuts to the fun in seconds. The framing, the narrative, is important to the lineage and directly informs the play, right? You wouldn't be destroying key Mars infrastructure in the hero role without a reason, but after establishing those reasons, the story pulls away and lets the player play. It's such a palette cleanse after a heavy JRPG or hardcore action game. And really, you could do whatever you want. It doesn't have the level of interactivity no. or like Grand Theft Auto or something. You're mostly stuck driving cars, doing missions, or freeform building destruction, but it manages to sell those forms of play as enough, satisfying, without trying too hard. I mean, the first time you level a building, 
Finally, some good f games. Like, what else do we expect from this medium? Interactivity is so important to video games. And while other genres sell other kinds of experiences, narrative, mechanical, musical, etc., getting to physically reach out into the world with a very large hammer is everything. The actual goal of the game is to liberate Mars, which is divided up into chunks. These little zones where the devs can couch missions and notable destructible infrastructure and story segments. So you roll into town, take this or that mission from timed carjacking to firefights with the EDF to property destruction turret segments, kind at you, but stick with me here, to demolition challenges with limited resources. So like destruction puzzles, I mean, I'm sorry. If you ain't played this, and you love games, just for the record, you're directly rewarded for doing all of this. All this destruction with scrap that lets you upgrade your ammo, your health, and damage, new weapons, explosion, incentivize more explosion! They got a lot of mileage out of Mars, too. I imagine keeping the surface of Mars away from players in the original was an intentional decision, but graphical advancements and conceptual work paid off here. Each area is distinct, even if they're similar. I mean, it's still Red Planet. It's like driving from small town Ontario 36 to small town Ontario 57, right? Not much is gonna change. Feel. So, there's the Stark Orange Parker, named after the original Red Faction Protag. Fedora Tip game Devs. I don't own a hat. Dust, the incredibly gray industrial zone. The irradiated, piss-yellow Badlands. The slightly green-tinted oasis, where the inhabitants are actively terraforming the planet. And Eos, the vaguely purple-tinted home of the Martian Council. Oh ho, the color of corruption. Fedora Tip video essayist. Spending time in these zones really gives you an appreciation appreciation for light attempts at world building. They could have slapped everything together as one big orange rock, but they took that extra effort, incorporated tall, overly perfect buildings in the more livable residential zones, put the bulk of the industrial equipment where those activities take place. It breathes just enough life into the world, a hardly hospitable planet in the first place, so that the player can turn off their brain and enjoy. I'm sure it all seems very low scope, and that's kind of true. You do enter zones, complete missions, blow oh. shit up, lower EDF control in his own, and take over each with one final story mission per. I know the guy was a torturer, but like, Jesus. It's a formulaic experience. I just happen to think the formula works. But part of why it works is the genuine excitement to engage with the systems. I'm talking a lot about demolition, but there's more fun to be had than pulling a Michael Bay on every conceivable structure. You're loaded up with all kinds of weapons, from basic stuff like shotguns and assault rifles, to more fun things like the arc welder, a big ol' electricity conducting, enemy stunning face pummeler, the nanotech rifle that just evaporates anything, anyone. You can melt a vehicle mid-air with it. God. Remote charges aren't new to the series, but double as amazing controllable grenades or building levelers. And this sledgehammer has to be like top 10 melee weapons ever made. They put a little charge on it so you can dash and kill anyone who gets too close. There's even singularity bombs that completely demolish anything around them. This game is incredible at instilling childlike wonder. Just being able to watch things that never happen in any any other game. Add to that a pile of bonus granting backpacks, the occasional jaunt in a mech. God, mech destruction appreciation post. What a f game. I love having to demolish some important building, finding a truck on the way, and ramming it all the way through the thing. The raw vibrations, the energy. I have never been a truck or a car person, and I feel like in real life this would most certainly kill me. But in Red Faction Guerrilla, I can feel. One thing you learn as you progress is that the original game informs this one directly. You find structures, actual parts of a Red Faction 1 level during the main plot, and get to read little bits about Altor, the corporation that originally colonized Mars. See one of the devs for some reason. It's a cool little addition, seeing that the tradition of the series and weight of its impact weren't taken for granted. Unfortunately, the story gets into some, uh, well, for lack of a better term, Omega Pupusus territory, and kind of undermines its messages a little. Let's talk about it. After making a concerted effort to destabilize the EDF, give power back to the workers of Mars, and seize weaponry that would be used to quash the rebellion in a blink, you find out that the original survivors of the original Red Faction incident were displaced by the EDF and sought to protect the technology they developed on Mars. And those scientists' descendants over centuries became scavengers relegated to the Badlands. They're called 
marauders in game, these brutal Mad Max-esque warriors treated like the indigenous people of Mars by the script. Only instead of making them scientific with a rough exterior, something like the proud and shamanic orcs in Warcraft, or like fairly typical people who've been hard done by and sought a communal survival. They cast the Marauders as spiritual, superstitious, tribal, barbaric. They actually managed to pull genuine Orientalism with a majority white population of highly educated people. How the f Except hold the f Whoa. phone, it gets funnier. The Marauders initially took up this entire barbarism facade to protect their technology. Like if we look scary and carry shotguns, we will trick the people with actual gunships and space travel into ignoring us. Apparently, and over time, that identity became imprinted in these descendants of scientists, in their very psyches, as culture, no longer a mere facade. I don't even think that's possible, but like, what a stupid f way to live. Like, are we supposed to believe a group of scientists were so disgusted by the corporation they worked for that at the first opportunity to be rescued by the EDF, they instead gave up all interest in human society and its comforts to protect some schematics, and it was unanimous and the ploy actually worked for generations without them being killed, and they became a group of psychologically deluded tribes people. To justify having Mad Max guys in your Mars fiction. Yeah, sure, okay, I mean, what the hell do I know? This is the core of why I found the original fascinating, but laughed off the execution. How ham-fisted it is? The original sold a good premise and took the bad guy to a place so insane it undercut the import of the work. A little. In Gorilla, we're pro-revolution, some praxis is happening, but we gotta treat the not-indigenous people as others. There's a certain responsibility you carry handling this kind of subject matter, so to make it cartoonish feels a little insulting. Sidling up to barefaced orientalism is bizarre at best. Given how the game handles everything else, how concerned it is with workers' movements and revolution, it's ugly. But I think I put more thought into why it's bad than anyone else did. If you never ask questions, did they ever exist in the first place? There's even a piece of DLC for the game that specifically works to flesh out the Marauders, at least a little. Actually, it's more a showcase for cool Marauders-specific weapons and a little more of what you already do in the main game. There's not much of a focus on telling a compelling story, which sucks, because it could have been a decent chance to redeem how incredibly weird the Marauders are as a fictional group, actually justify them in-universe, or make an attempt. Though the effort required may have been both Herculean and Wasteland it ultimately. Red Faction Guerrilla is a fun game, you play with your brain off, so why bother thinking? I don't like reviewing games and leaving it at game fun. Game fun. Guerrilla was so fun it actually motivated me to play. Intrinsically rewards the player by handing out amazing weapons to topple big yeah. buildings. It really ain't that deep. So let's go deep. Let's go there. Back under the surface. Mars. This has been a seg. Red Faction Armageddon, devved by Volition like every other game and published jointly by THQ and the games division of American cable channel Sci-Fi, strangely enough, fans were confused. See, Gorilla did okay and served as the series' entry point for many players. Even though Red Faction and its sequel hit consoles themselves, I never thought much of them if I ever saw them on shelves, and Gorilla was a total chance pickup. And I can't tell you how exciting it was getting a shot at a Gorilla sequel. It could have been legendary. What fans got, instead of an open-world building wrecker sim, was a linear third-person shooter with mere traces of the destruction possible in Gorilla. And people didn't take it very well. I just outright ignored the game myself, until playing the PC version after all these years, and uh, I actually like it a lot. Oh, shit. Look, Gorilla is good, and you can imagine anything to any scale if you want. Conjure up a whole insane sequel in your head, but that doesn't make the scope realistic at all. Bigger and better is how people view sequels, and Armageddon wasn't. Oh, and a handful of games discourse people ruined the linear label around the same time, so Armageddon more or less got marched out to die. And I'm not overly enthused here. It's still a repeat of what happened in the original pair. Gorilla sold a working class uprising as fairly as any game would publish. And Armageddon is about a crew cutting good old boy son of a Ooh. shooting a bunch of cultists, because that's how far we've fallen, I guess. And you're not gonna believe this. 
plague aliens. Yes, it's all the fault of the original game's villain and a direct continuation of what occurs in that story, but all three preceding titles focus on humans. The first shot of the aliens was bizarre, actually confusing as a result. Like, really? I have to fight the Aliens? all game? Basically, any worthwhile commentary has been sucked out the series' anus via industrial vacuum tube. You get cultists, aliens, and one-liner factories. Watch your ass out there. In this storm, can't even see my ass. Sorry, come again, sweetie? I don't speak Mandu jackass. This all said, Armageddon's kind of schmoovin, and it's because of a single gun. Is it Mr. Toots, the rainbow unicorn gun? Show that to me again and I'll evaporate your family. No, it's the magnet gun. It lets you shoot a point and then another point and all the stuff near the first point will get flung towards the second. Do you have any idea what that means? Create enemy restraining orders in real time. Fling gigantic cave crystals into enemies at light speed. Pull enemies from the ground to some far off object so fast they burst. Send explosives hurtling towards anything. Pull whole chunks of buildings into swarms of foes. Literally tear the sides off walls and do these guys like the weather guy in the day after tomorrow. The entire game becomes a destructible playground, responds directly to player creativity, incentivizes experimentation and joy. I don't care about all that other crap. The perpetual Baldman, the weak alien and cultist plot. I don't care about shotguns or laser pistols or remote charge launchers or whatever other weapon. This feature alone, I guess combined with the buildings and how it all interacts with the engine, make the game playable. Shoot, I think you could pop this on easy and stream it no matter who you are. Thing's a blast. And it sucks that any good was immediately drowned by a deluge of It's not like Gorilla. It's all underground. It's gross. Linear shooter. Eee! I've said this before and I'm saying it now. Linear does not equal bad. It means the designers can plot out a really cohesive ramping challenge that's rewarding and well considered. Setting it underground is fairly annoying, especially especially with how dark the visuals get, but it's not all underground. To be fair, and it's an aesthetic choice, they attempt to vary presentation just like Gorilla. The game's playing up the light action horror, and it works to set the tone. And man, you can play Gorilla. It's right there. This ain't Zelda. This ain't whatever always buy franchise you tap into. It's Red Faction. Take it or leave it you'll live. Armageddon got a bad rap and didn't deserve it. Even acknowledging any meaningful critique of the game and it's out there, none of it detracts from the actual fun of the experience, right? The creativity, the play, why we play games. I can't believe I'm trying to rehabilitate Armageddon 12 years later. Oh yeah, you can reconstruct debris too, which I, I just remembered so I could make a little visual gag with the rehabilitation idea. It's cool. The environments usually get torn to shreds from your own explosions or enemy fire, so it's necessary for progression. I've seen reviews like, you spend time reconstructing environments instead of blowing them up, which is so insane and small and petty. This actually extends to the story. A couple people take issue uh, because Darius here could resolve a lot of plot points, for lack of a better term, by simply using that ability. But oh no, a character in a video game behaved inconsistently with a real intelligent person? I'm so sorry. Now, magnet gun aside, the stage-by-stage -stage gameplay is fine. You do a lot of little objectives in arenas and ride transport thingies and trample over enemies in a little walker unit, casually snuff out any marauder resistance because we're back to casting them as villains. I bet the creator would call them Ooga Booga guys and not even wince. Not even wince. <laughs> But you're mostly stuck fighting the aliens. Let's just call them Zerg, because that's what they are. Combat's designed with intention this time, and that probably ticked some people off. Just break down enemy types and you'll see what I mean. Instead of soldiers, soldiers, and Mad Max guys, you instead fight a bunch of Zerglings that swarm you and make it hard to stay in one place, big leaping ranged attackers that make it hard to stay in one place and focus on the ground level as well, big brutes who get in your face and make it hard to pay attention to the ranged attackers, humanoids of various kinds that actually work how third-person shooters should, you know, shoulder your gun and headshot, feels good, shame nothing else really feels like that. Oh, and invisible guys that snipe at range. Then there's the weird pustules that provide a buff to any 
any given alien on screen that take a good few explosives to down and you've got a recipe for a single player CBT. Oh it's a very difficult game on higher difficulties because it pulls player attention in so many directions. Very disorienting experience. Not too dissimilar to Gungrave Gore actually. And frankly the end section is just disgusting. Like the raw number of bugs you gotta churn through to eventually after what feels like 30 minutes to an hour of straight combat or like 10 minutes of running on easy mode face off with a very big worm guys what's with people and worm bosses what's the character of the worm what's the pathos why do we like worms so much is it dune is it dune which contextualized the worms and made them important this isn't dune this is a big idiot plague worm and i don't care and like every single game you save the planet everyone cheers the end I don't think it's helpful to the discussion to talk about the death of Red Faction. Armageddon flopped hard and killed the franchise. That's what we know. They just said it. Ouch. And it really seems like a case of wrong release, wrong time. Yes, the farting rainbow unicorn was there. Yes, the grim, cringy action man dude versus psychotic cultists and aliens framing diminished the roots of a potentially good story. Nobody really asked for this version of Red Faction, and Gorilla was well loved in its time. Shoot, this entry made other more successful Red Faction stories look worse by comparison, at least compared to 1 and 3. But in retrospect, I can appreciate the raw, gamey energy in Armageddon, the emphasis on gameplay and physics. It's hard to say, I had fun, and that's bad. Is it the purpose of the reviewer to inform a potential player, weigh in on a purchase, critique as art, evaluate a story, etc.? Game review is born from the medium it discusses, the most multifaceted mosaic medium there is, and I think it's why game review can accommodate a range of voices from spoony era character to sharp modern video essayists. There's room for schlock, as long as it's fun, and there's room for cutting analysis, as long as it isn't too dreary. And those boundaries probably stretch further in either direction than any one person can reasonably imagine. Red Faction was, since its conception, derivative. It was broadly compared to Half-Life and found lacking by many. Similarities between the plot and the film Total Recall were noted by more than one critic, even if the developers denied that potential inspirational link. But it sold well, and that greenlit a sequel. Red Faction 2 found an audience, but partially riding the coattails of Halo's dual-wielding and an absolute mountain of cringy action movie tropes, it practically abandons its roots in every way possible. It's kind of insane. While its sales numbers aren't perfectly public, we do know that the developers swapped genres moving into the third entry, which isn't unheard of per se, but it shows a willingness to expand past the established drapery of Red Faction past. It nailed the execution with a solid gameplay gimmick and welcomed old fans back into the fold with an expanded Mars universe. Armageddon should have been great, heading back into the mines, creating new stories, and expanding the legacy. But it turns out, people just wanted to blow shit up. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolis, Alpha, 42, All Snaps, Arch, Azura, Axin A, Audra, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Bing Bing Doo Doo, Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Hargle Hargle, Boom Dead, Brios, Brianna Wu, British Gooch, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wade, C-Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Cordon, Chris Bromo, Cody Golden, Couch Mo, Corgi the Lad, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glass, Kyle Lapree, Cynical, Daddy Dago, Don Diem, Danny Lavelle, Danny Pan, Mangos. Dakota Storm Jones, Jakey Stank, David Bad. Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Dead. Dennis Amaya, The Strega, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doug Prince, Dr. Cullen, PhD, The Protagonist, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Thug, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Eric Monticello, Aesthetico, Everstone Isle, Exa, Nar, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyphseeker, Nine Cat, Goose, 6112, Great, The Darkest Black, Gucci Plant, Asi Ibrahim Tanirga, Atsune Miku's Crackhouse, Parkash, Demon, Game and Stake, 
Nation. X-Men. Horn Tiger. How do you know? Huey. I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Ingenious Clown. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated Cherry. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jacob. James. Jason Lasky. Jaden. Jay Dayas. JK Hedgehog. John Bo the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Jules. DLC. Julian My Julian. Keegan Too Cool. Kata Snack. King Kuma. Keech. Can I Pike. Clock. Tongue 2020. Crazy. Crazy. Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Pike. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalian. Lady Weed. Lady Tricks. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Lethal Nibbles. Little Big Trouble. Loathsome Dung Eater. Warren. Low Fat Mogul. Lucas Boy. Lucky McSmucky. Mac James. Loopin the Turd. Magical Mad Man. Mama Rollin. Mara Ganger. Mercules. Mars Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Metal Gear Gashes. Mike DeVille. Mookie Moo Official. Mikusagi. Monochrome Only. Modi. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Mr. Yeedy Dabface McYoink Bone. No. Nirenew. Nito Torpedo. Nico Puzzle Rack. Dorian Daridius. Not Nobel. Nuggy. Old Burgle. Old Man Cramp. Army Nerd Zero. Army LK. Plant. Pandemic Cowboy. Pinata. PBK. PK Gaming. Pontus Redding. Popular Hitman. Potato Gaming HD. Prismatic Dan. Fractal and Pals. Quasar McDougal, Quillwork, Quinn, Rad Punk, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Renteca Bond, Ricochet, Friend Relay, Roy Londo, Ryan Mori Brooks, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smash, Scribe Slendy, Say Say, Sakai No Award, Sexy Bionicle GF, Shot. Shinigami, Shut Up Wesley, Silver Bear 909, Sing God! Sleepy Wabbit. Suck em Boppers. Suck Dolager. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squidget. Squishward. Star Knight Sky. Storm Strider and the House of Storm. Streetums. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Sandwich Guy. Harvold's Quest. Jordan Chubbington. The Big Bubby. The Clown Prince of Cream. The Digital Dutchman. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah. The Green Loki. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Dick Mystic. Drips Heart Trap. Tiggles McGuffin. Tim Lobster. Timid the Writer. Turtle Play. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chung. Ty Guy 9000. One. Vid. Valen Rift. Venom. Vice Plot. Viewers like you. Vic. Waposa. Weed Trash. Wayland. Where am I? Widgy. Winter Solstice. Wood TV. Zanny Tanner. Yashi Chi. Yay Kundo. Your mom. Winky Face. Zachary Lives. Zachary Z. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Zalazar. Sylvan Ray. Zenova. Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.